This is Brian Kirby from KirbyResearch.com. In this video, we'll talk about non-dimensionalization of the Navier-Stokes equations with specific applications to microfluidics. We're interested in simplifications of the Navier-Stokes equations when the length scale is small. To investigate this, we'll non-dimensionalize these Navier-Stokes equations. So for starters, we write the Navier-Stokes equations as follows. With these Navier-Stokes equations, we have a couple of symbols that are important to define. We have the density, the time, this velocity u, the pressure p, and the viscosity, which we will denote with an eta. Now our approach is to non-dimensionalize these parameters, the velocity, the pressure, and the time, using five different factors. The density rho, the viscosity eta, some characteristic time, and some reference length and reference velocity. These five different parameters that we'll use to non-dimensionalize will then lead to two non-dimensional terms. And these two non-dimensional terms will describe the relative magnitudes of these different derivative terms, these four different derivative terms in these equations. In particular, these two non-dimensional terms that we will come up with should be independent of the unit system because they're inherently unitless. So to do that, we need to define a number of characteristic parameters. So first we'll define characteristic length scales. And we'll non-dimensionalize the lengths in the system. So we can consider the system in any of a variety of coordinate frames, but if we, for the moment, assume that we're in a Cartesian coordinate frame, we can non-dimensionalize these, uh, these coordinates, x and y and z, by some characteristic length l. When we do that, we're effectively saying that the gradient and the Laplacian in this equation which are derivatives with respect to the spatial coordinates, are also being non-dimensionalized. And so we can write non-dimensional versions of the gradient and also the Laplacian. Now in all these cases we've used a characteristic length L, and this characteristic length L comes from the boundary conditions. And so for an example, if we're considering a microfluidic channel, one typical characteristic length that we might use is the diameter of the channel or the radius of the channel. If we're talking about flow around a small particle, we might consider the diameter or the radius of that particle. Now we also need to consider time scales. And so in this case, we will non-dimensionalize the time in this equation by some reference time. Now this reference time really needs to be the fastest time scale in the problem. And what makes what we're deciding between when we consider the fastest time scale of the problem is one, the inherent nature of the fluid to change, which is given by L divided by U, or some characteristic time with which the boundary conditions are changing. So if the boundary conditions are steady, the characteristic time of the problem is always L over U. If the boundary conditions are changing very quickly, then we'll find that the, those changes associated with that boundary condition are really the thing that drives the problem. And so if we define a characteristic time in, over which the boundary conditions are changing, we want to compare that to L over U, find whichever one is faster, and that's the one that we'll use as the fastest time scale in our problem. We also need to non-dimensionalize the velocity. 
And to do that, we will divide our velocity by some reference velocity u. This capital U is the same capital U we use to describe the reference time, and is some characteristic velocity, again, from the boundary conditions. So this characteristic velocity might be the inlet velocity of some flow, or it might be the speed with which some boundary is moving. And then finally, we need to non-dimensionalize the pressure. And so we'll non-dimensionalize this pressure by a characteristic viscous shear stress. And this characteristic viscous shear stress will be given by the viscosity eta times a characteristic velocity u non or normalized by a characteristic length l. And we'll discuss later why that's the particular value that we chose. Now, once we have these non-dimensional parameters defined, we can then look at this Navier-Stokes equations and we can replace all of these dimensional terms, u, t, rho, p, etc with some reference value, like capital U or L of the reference time, plus a non-dimensional term. And so that's indicated by the notation in red. This then leads us to a new form of the equation. If we make all of these substitutions, All of our derivative terms are in terms of non-dimensional parameters, but we have a whole bunch of pre-multiplying terms. Now we can take this and we can divide through by this value here. And when we do that, we can then organize the resulting equation into a convenient form that isolates two non-dimensional terms that affect the relative magnitudes of the terms in this equation. So now this equation has four derivative terms. All of these four derivative terms are cast in terms of non-dimensional parameters. So if we look at those four derivative terms, one here, one here, one here, and one here, if we've non-dimensionalized these values correctly, we hope that all of these non-dimensional derivative terms are of order one everywhere in the flow. And what that means is that the relative magnitudes of these different terms is dictated not by the derivatives themselves, but by these pre-multiplying factors. When we look at these pre-multiplying factors, we can see that there is one written here, and we can define this as the Reynolds number. In front of the time-dependent term, we have both a Reynolds number, 
and also an additional term. This term is basically the ratio of the characteristic flow time scale, L over U, normalized by this reference time. And the reason why this term is important is if the boundary conditions are changing very, very quickly as compared to the flow itself, then this multiplicative factor will highlight a difference between the relative magnitude of the temporal term to the convective term. So this additional term we see here is equal to 1 over the Struhall number, where we define the Struhall number as this reference temperature, or this reference time, over the characteristic flow time scale L over U. So again, if the boundary conditions are steady, the reference time we use is L over U, and the Struhall number becomes 1. But in the case where the boundary conditions are changing, then the Struhall number can be different. Now, given this form that we've derived, we can now rewrite this as our final solution. This is now the non-dimensionalized form of the Navier-Stokes equations, and it includes the possibility that our boundary conditions could be changing. We can see that the relative magnitude of these terms is given by the magnitude of the Reynolds number and the magnitude of the Struhall number. Again, the idea was that we, if we non-dimensionalize these parameters correctly, the derivative terms would be approximately of order 1, and their relative magnitudes are dictated by these two non-dimensional parameters. Now, if we're considering this system for a microfluidic flow, then we expect that the Reynolds number will be small because the length scales are small and the characteristic velocities of microfluidic flows are small. And so in that case, we can neglect, neglect these two terms on the left-hand side. In fact, the only time that we wouldn't be able to do this is if the boundary conditions were changing so quickly that the Struhall number basically would cancel out the effect of the Reynolds number on this first term. Once we've done that, we can now eliminate these first two terms, and we can now rewrite this equation, including only the two terms from the left-hand side. And this simplified form of the Navier-Stokes equations is known as the Stokes equations. And again, these are valid for low values of the Reynolds number. We can, if we want to, take this same equation and return it to a dimensional form. in case that's the form that's more convenient for our calculations. Now, what really tells us that our non-dimensionalization was correct? We asserted that if we did things correctly, the derivative terms would all be of the same order, but we're not really sure that we did that correctly. In fact, we made some difficult decisions. For example, we decided to non-dimensionalize the pressure by a viscous shear stress. We could have non-dimensionalized the pressure by a dynamic pressure, for example, rho times u squared. What we find is that once we have chosen a non-dimensionalization, or once we have a solution to the governing equations, we now have information that informs us whether that non-dimensionalization was correct. It turns out that we know for low Reynolds number flows that the viscous forces dominate over the inertial forces. In fact, that, that ratio is what really defines the Reynolds number anyway. And so we know for small scale flows for low Reynolds number flows that the viscous shear stress is the one that will be dominant and that's the proper one to non-dimensionalize the pressure term by. We also know that if we chose a different value for uh, non-dimensionalizing the pressure, we would come to a contradiction and that our non-dimensionalization would tell us to basically neglect all of the terms in the equation and we wouldn't be able to find a solution. So a combination of both checking our answers or having some foreknowledge of where our answer needs to be tells us how to properly non-dimensionalize these terms. So in summary, we can non-dimensionalize the Navier-Stokes equations. When we do so, that leads to the form on the top of this page, shown here. In addition, that form allows us to neglect the two terms on the left-hand side of the equation. That allows us to write a simplified form of the equation, which is shown here.
And these Stokes equations are the governing equations that we use for low Reynolds numbers.